Today's lead code problem is count subarrays with fixed bounds. This is a hard daily problem which uses ideas from dynamic programming to help us. You are given an integer array nums and two integers min k and max k. Next, we define a fixed bound subarray as a subarray whose minimum value is exactly min k and whose maximum value is exactly max k. Our job is to count the number of subarrays that fit this criteria. Let's start by looking at some examples. In example one, nums is 135275. Min k is one and max k is five. There are two fixed bound subarrays in this example. One, three, and five. Its minimum is one, which matches min k, and its maximum is five, which matches max k. One, three, five, two is also a fixed bound subarray, and it fulfills the same constraints. The output for example one is therefore two, since there are two fixed bound subarrays. The subarray 527, for instance, will not be a valid subarray because its maximum is seven, and that does not match max k, which is five. More interestingly, 352 is also not a valid fixed bound subarray because even though its minimum two is between one and five, it's between min k and max k, two is not exactly equals to one, which disqualifies it. So the numbers in the fixed bound subarray do not only have to be between min k and max k, its minimum has to be exactly min k and its maximum has to be exactly max k. In example two, min k and max k are both one and nums is just a sequence of one. This is a sort of degenerate case where every single subarray is actually a valid fixed bound subarray. Now that you've understood the problem, I want you to think about how you would solve the problem. So pause the video right here, take out a piece of pen and paper and start doodling a little bit. Try and think what your strategy is gonna be. All right, are you ready? The first thing I like to do when faced with a new problem is just play around with a few examples and see if I can observe a, a pattern Let's look at example one and try and solve it by hand. The first thing we notice is that for any subarray to be valid, it has to contain at least one copy of min k and one copy of max k. This makes sense, right? If you want the subarray to have a minimum equal to min k and a maximum equal to max k, then it has to contain at least those two numbers. If it doesn't, say in the, exa uh, the case of 352, then clearly it will never have a minimum equals to min k. The next thing we notice is that these subrays must never contain a number smaller than min k or larger than max k. If it contains a number larger than max k, let's say in seven in this example, then of course its maximum cannot possibly be five. Essentially, we can divide the numbers in nums into four categories. There are the min k's, there are those that are equal to max k. There are those that are smaller than min k or larger than max k. These are the bad numbers with the black cross. And then there's the numbers that are in between min k and max k. These are sort of like MPC numbers. You don't care too much about them. In fact, we can stop thinking of nums as an array of numbers, but as small uh, sequence of color blocks. The actual value of each numbers does not matter at all. All we want to know is its type. Is it a red min k? Is it a blue max k? Is it a black, those bad numbers we have to avoid? Or is it a white, just regular MPC number between min and max k? Our job now turns into counting the number of fixed bound subarrays that contain at least one red, at least one blue, and cannot touch any black blocks. So this, as well as this, are both possible solutions. How do we use this information? Looking at a slightly larger example, we start to notice that these black blocks essentially partition nums into several different segments. A valid subarray must never cross any of these black blocks. So it stands to reason then we can think about each of these segments independently. So the number of valid subarrays for nums would simply be the sum of the valid subarrays for all the different segments. Now we've gone through quite a bit of information here. So let's do a quick recap. First, we've identified that every valid subarray must follow these three rules. They must have at least one copy of min k, they must have at least one copy of max k, and they cannot have any numbers smaller than min k or larger than max k. Next, we use that information to reconceptualize our input, not as an array of numbers, but as essentially a, a, a sequence of colored blocks. A valid subarray must contain at least one red block, at least one blue block, and have to avoid all the black blocks in between. This allows us to then partition the input into segments separated by gaps of black blocks. 
since subrays cannot cross black blocks, the number of subrays for nums is equal to the sum of the number of subrays for all of each individual segments. How do we count how many valid subarrays are there in each segment? Well, let's hang on to our heads for that one. Now, I want you to appreciate how much we have taken a large complicated problem at the beginning and broken it down and simplified it so that we end up with smaller, more solvable problems. This is a very gen uh, common strategy in programming. You start with a difficult problem, you simplify it, and you tackle each simple problem individually before putting everything back together again. Now, even though we don't know exactly how to solve the rest of the problem yet, we do know enough to start writing some code. The first thing we're going to do is to add helper functions to figure out what type each particular cell is. You don't actually have to do this. You can do the com manual comparison every time you want to check, but making helper functions make your life so much easier. In Python, you can actually define these functions inside a different function, but in Java and C++, you actually have to pull these helper functions outside the function. But I'm going to leave you to figure that out yourself. Next, we're going to define a variable count which stores our final output. And for each segment, we are going to count how many valid subarrays there are in the segment and then add it to count. To identify where these segments are, we use a start pointer. We write a simple while loop that keeps adding one to start until it lands on a non-black square. This is where our segment is going to start. Likewise, we use a end pointer. And we're going to add one to end repeatedly until it reaches a black square. And this is where our segment ends. Now, how do we count the number of valid subarrays in this segment between start and end? We're going to have to figure that out. But before that, if you are enjoying this video, make sure to check out the rest of my channel and get notified every time I release a new video by throwing me a like and subscribe. How many subarrays in this segment has at least one red and at least one blue? Well, if there's exactly one red and exactly one blue in the segment, then we know that all valid subarrays must contain the red and the blue. The smallest possible subarray that contains the red and the blue is this one. We can get to additional other subarrays by expanding to the left and towards the right. Aha, do you see a pattern emerging? Since a valid subarray can start at any of the three squares on the left of the red and end in any of the four squares on the right of the blue square, the total number of possible subarrays is 3 times 4 equals to 12. Specifically, the number of subarrays in this segment is red minus start plus 1 times end minus blue. This formula is really important, so make sure you keep it in your back pocket. We can come back to it later. This also works when the blue square appears before the red square. We simply swap the values of red and blue. What if there was more than one red or one blue in the segment? Specifically, if n was not on a black square, but was on, say, a red square, and the segment continues on. Well, in that case, we already know how many valid subarrays are there who finish before the current end position. There are 12 of them. All we have to do is to add the number of subarrays who finish at or after the end index. How will we do that? Well, for starters, we know that all valid subarrays finishing at end or after must contain this second red square. If that's the case, we could pick the closest blue square to pair with this red. All valid subarrays must contain a blue and red. So if it has a red already at the end position, then the closest blue is the last one before it. Now, if we move the end index to the next black square, we can use the same formula we had before to calculate how many subarrays there are. This time, the number of valid subarrays who end at the second red square or later is five because that's the number of cells before the blue square, multiplied by three, and that gives you 15. We're gonna add this 15 to the original number of three times four, which is 12, and it gives us a total of 27. This diagram can be a little bit complicated, but its basic idea is inspired by dynamic programming. If you know how to solve inputs up to a certain point, then all we have to do is to incrementally solve the rest of the inputs and add that to whatever knowledge we had from before. The same principle also applies if the new square is blue. Just like before, the new square is a must-have, except this time we pair it with the last red square we've seen. All new valid subarrays must contain both of these squares. This is very similar to what we did just a while before, except the colors are reversed. Instead of looking for the last blue square, we now look for last red square. We use the same formula as before, 
This time with the colors reversed, count two equals to red minus start plus one times n minus blue. How do we count the number of valid subrays in a segment? Step one, keep moving n until we hit a non-white cell. If n is on a colored cell, update the value of the red or blue pointer to n. If we have previously seen at least one red and one blue, then we apply the count formula. Smaller is the index that came first. Larger is the index that came later. Count is equals to smaller minus start plus one times n minus larger. If n is at the end of a segment, i.e. a black square, this means our segment is done and we can move on to the next one. Don't forget to add the last count at the very end. Now, we are finally ready to fill in the gaps in our program from before. But first, I want you to try yourself. If you are so inclined, pause the video right here open up your favorite compiler and see if you can fill in the missing question mark using the pseudocode we've just written. Okay, are you ready? Well, if you end up with something like this, then you probably got it right. Hey, but wait, are we forgetting something? There was an edge case in example two where min k equals to max k. Fixing this edge case isn't too difficult. We add an extra condition that checks when min k equals max k. We just calculate the length of the segment and then we apply the formula n times n plus one divided by two. The solution for today's problem is available in Python, C++ and Java versions and they're available from GitHub. See video description for the link. If you enjoy LeetCode content, make sure to check out the rest of my channel. We have problem solutions, weekly contest live streams, as well as general tips on technical interview questions. As usual, like and subscribe to my channel to stay up to date on new videos. Come back and code cool along with me. This is Alexis Lee Code. More generally for the special case where min k equals max k and nums is just a sequence of min k or max k, then the number of fixed bound subarrays is equals to one plus two plus three plus four all the way to a length of nums. This can be calculated using the standard sum of arithmetic progression formula n times n plus one divided by two. In this case, n is four and the output is 10.